This is uh, Angelica, it's a root. And the fat part of the root is what we call the head, which nourishes the blood. And then the thinner part that goes to tails moves the blood. Right. So just tails okay. actually move the blood through the channels. And the head is, is more substantial and has a nourishing quality. If somebody puts their tongue out equally and it's very pale, it means they have an anemia or blood deficiency. So again, you would use a combination of herbs to nourish and build the blood up. If somebody sticks their tongue out and it's very cracked, like a desert, then you know that there's a lot of dehydration going on. And people say, well, should I drink more water then? And you go, well, no. It's much more complicated. It's more difficult than, than that. Yeah. You actually need to treat the organs that are involved in circulating fluids, retaining fluids, and nourishing the body. A lot of people will drink more water and it'll just go through them. And that's the problem. So, yes, yeah, the tongue will tell many, many different stories as to what's going on within the person's system. So you're really building up in the kind of half an hour, an hour you spend with the person, a kind of a file of information in your head or you're writing it down and it's on the psychological side, yeah. it's on the physical side, the senses mm. side, it's the information they give you. Mm. And I guess you're also using a degree of intuition as well, are you? Intuition will only work if you have the knowledge and experience there. I, I like to think that intuition, in fact, is ability to connect different areas that otherwise you couldn't see connections. But the, those areas are tangible knowledge. And the intuition, as I say, is the connections. Intuition is like inner tuition as well. It's the sort of the inner learning that you have within your cell. So it could go beyond Chinese medicine. It can actually go um, empathy, your ability to empathize with a patient, your um, ability to have lived and had similar experiences that the patients also had. You've been into similar mind states that the patients had. All, all that uh, is part of intuition as well. That inner tuition that tells you what you should do next to help that person. And the main thing about it is that in, in terms of practice, you find the most interesting thing in the universe is people. P there's nothing else more interesting than people. And to me that's logical because I'm a person. And that and, keeps you motivated to a yeah, large extent. Yeah, yeah when I somebody comes that. into the room, it doesn't yeah. matter who they are. Yeah. Um, you want to know about them. You want to know their story, how they came to this particular place. Yeah. You want to know about all the positive things about them as well as the negative things about them and, and the imbalances within them. And yes, yeah, so each person that comes in, it's a detective novel. They're a mystery. and Because every case is different, I guess. Every case is yeah, completely yeah. different. Even though you have 10 people with asthma, every person's story will be different and different things will be producing the condition that we call asthma. You see, that's something I, I, I really find fascinating because you get more and more good uh, medicines marketed, whether they be drug medicines or herbal or mm. alternative whatever, saying so you take this and this will cure your asthma or this will help with whatever. And of course, as you say, every case is individual. So what works for one person for one problem yeah. wouldn't necessarily work for the next person with exactly the same problem on the Unless face of it. Unless you use something very powerful that actually has a broad sweep across the population in terms of controlling their symptoms, not curing them or healing them, right. but controlling those symptoms. If you use a very powerful drug agent, you can then treat 100 people with asthma and have a certain percentage of what they call effectiveness, in that you can actually control the symptoms. Does that also apply to, to Chinese medicine as well, Chinese herbs as well? To an extent, it would apply more if we actually took extracts from the herbs. If we actually extracted the po most potent chemicals from the herbs and used them symptomatically, you could have a similar effect. In fact, we must remember that a lot of the pharmaceutical drugs are actually produced from plants, herbs anyway. And the pharmaceutical industry are continuing to pursue that line to develop new drugs out of taking the, the most potent extract. But the way that we see it is that we use the whole plant because the many aspects that make up that one plant gives it its character. And we don't want to take, you know, in herbal medicine, you, you're not interested in taking a potent extract and using it symptomatically. You're interested in using a whole plant combined with other whole plants to have a holistic effect in order right. to improve the person's health rather right. than to control a particular symptom. So it's a different way of thinking. And does the person's cooperation 
is that important to you in terms of their recovery? Or do you basically give them the treatment with the acupuncture and the herbs? They go away and do what do they need to do with those? And they come back and if it works, they're healed? Or is there some kind of input that's important from the patient to contribute to their healing? Yes, I mean, essentially, um, most people with chronic conditions really need to uh, go through a review of their whole lifestyle in terms of their diet, in terms of exercise or lack of it, in terms of mind and mood. Maybe they're, they're stuck in a certain rut. They need to find things to open them up, to move them on, to inspire them. Uh, in terms of doing things like yoga or tai chi, again, to help bring balance and strength to the body. In terms of preparation of the herbs, uh, in terms of uh, dietary changes and, and sort of not e eating all the treats on a daily basis but having their treats maybe once a week. Developing more discipline is, is essential. And, and usually uh, with uh, chronic conditions, people just need some guidance. And a lot of people respond and very happy to have that guidance and have somebody overviewing and bringing them back into a certain disciplined way of life. Yes, because more and more people seem to be somehow losing touch with having, with having a healthy body and they seem to get out of balance much more easily. There's so many temptations now with our time mm. in terms of we get so busy in life. It becomes harder to find this balance and to find the inner discipline to help us keep us on the straight and narrow, so as to speak. Well, I'd like to see in schools, for instance, nutrition being a major subject. It's as important as mathematics or as English uh, or whatever language you're learning, whatever country you're in. But I would like to see nutrition as being a major subject and being at an exam levels um, and as an essential part. And also exercise as well. Not a question of just going out and kicking a football around or hitting a hockey ball but actually more structured exercises with explanations as to, yeah, it's fun, but also some explanations as to what the exercise is doing. And so people have more education about their bodies and how their bodies work and how over-exercising can damage you as much as under-exercising. And what are the most common factors you find these days, you know, with maybe new illnesses or people coming along with the same conditions? Um, well, because we're Chinese herbalists, of course, uh, we're famous uh, for dermatology. Um, so that's problems with the skin. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Ever since the 80s, uh, Chinese herbal medicine has been made famous for its results in treating skin conditions that other disciplines can't touch. Uh, so we, we see a lot of patients for, with skin conditions, um, mostly successfully. Um, and then autoimmune and allergies. I mean, one in three people in this country now, uh, through surveys, have autoimmune conditions or allergies. Um, some people say between 30 to 50 percent, actually, in Western countries. Depends on how people's definition of allergies vary, but at least 30 percent, or just almost one in three people. So just briefly, because we're doing a separate program on this later, yeah. but what does autoimmune disease mean? Well, allergies and autoimmune are in the same um, basket, if you like. Allergies is a more superficial reaction to substances within the environment, external so, substances from so the environment. So when you say allergy, you mean like a skin irritation or yes, whether problems it's with a, the stomach? Or... Atopic asthma or, okay. or allergic rhinitis, hay fever, or urticaria or eczema is a more superficial allergy. Where autoimmune system is a deeper condition, more constitutional condition, where the or, um, immune system seems to be attacking the tissues deeper within the body. So you can have things like um, SLE, a systemic lupus, um, which is quite an increasing condition. And you can have MS as well, which is also an increasing condition where the immune system seems to be attacking the sheath around the nerves, destroying the nerves. So you're losing motor function. Uh, diabetes now, I'm seeing more and more uh, problems with diabetes becoming an autoimmune condition. The, the, the list is getting bigger and bigger. Right. Okay, Ken, we're going to now make a separate program talking about this. Okay. I want to thank you for coming along, talking to Conscious TV. Thank you for watching, and try to stay tuned for the next program. Goodbye.